All right, so we're now live. We're live streaming on Facebook and uh, Zoom is now available to all participants and attendees. So um, yeah, we'll be starting promptly at nine. Uh, sorry, 10. Senator's not here then? Oh, just logged in. Hello, Daryl. Welcome. I am not Daryl. I don't know why it says Daryl Swain. Oh. Is this Senator I, Bradford? I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me uh, let's try to change your name. Senator. Hi, Senator Bradford. My name is Jennifer Trotter, and I'll be the moderator today. How are you doing? Good, and you? I'm here. Good morning, Senator Kelly Irvin. How are you? Glad you can join us. I'm mad at you, Kelly Irvin. <laughs> Please don't. Why? <laughs> don't be. <laughs> Why? You call me, I call you back, and I don't hear back from you. Well, you know what? Mr. Swinney took care of it all for us. Uh, don't call me that. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? I'm well, sir. Thank you so much. How's your mom? Everyone's doing quite well. Good. Everyone, the senator is my is he, he will always be my boss. So. Stop. <laughs> no, I work for you. So blame for me you. on him, okay? Blame <laughs> blame him on me. Uh huh. Blame you on me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. It's ten o'clock. Would um, would you like to start the presentation. All right, the presentation is, ready. is, is already ready. Thank you. Good morning and happy Monday. Thank you for joining the Regional Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Prop 16 Forum, a voter education event. My name is Jennifer Trotter and I'm one of the members of the Regional Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as well as the Business Diversity Manager for Burns & McDonald Engineering. 
Prop 16 seeks to repeal Prop 209 from 1996 and amend the California Constitution to permit uh, state and local government decision-making policies to consider race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin to address diversity in public education, public employment, and public contracting. The mission of, reg of the Regional Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is to advocate, promote, and facilitate the success of businesses in the Southern California region. That is why understanding the implications of Prop 16 is so important for the, for the Chamber as well as its member organizations. We will have an opportunity to hear from both the yes and the no um, positions on Prop 16. So, Thank you, Senator Bradford, for participating and representing the yes on Prop 16 position, as well as board member Ochoa for joining us today, representing the no on Prop 16 position. After the proponents and opponents of Prop 16 share their positions, we will hold a panel to discuss in further detail the potential or anticipated impacts of Prop 16. Our first speaker today will be Senator Bradford he has 20 years of public, ex public service experience, including as council member of city of Gardena, where he first started his, um, his career in public service, following by state assembly member and now state senator. During his time in public office, he has fought for job creation, economic development, and racial equity. Please help me in virtually welcoming Senator Bradford, co-author of ACA 5 that put Prop 16 on the ballot, to provide an argument in favor of Prop 16. Senator Bradford, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jennifer, and I just want to correct one thing. I got my political start as uh, working for Kelly Irving when I was <laughs> Congressman uh, Juanita Miller and McDonald's district director, so that was my true introduction to politics at its best form. But uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction and thank uh, the Regional Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for this important discussion this morning. Um, I'm somewhat miffed that there's anyone who would be animately opposed to Proposition 16. Proposition 16 is a common sense measure that provides equity, uh, equality, uh, racial balance to who we are as a state, and it should be embraced as who we are as a nation. Uh, to say that we should exclude race and gender and employment and education opportunities flies in the face of this constitution, a constitution that was formed over 240 years ago that used race and gender as the foundation of this nation. Uh, denying women the right to vote, <laughs> listing African Americans as three fifths of a citizen, exploiting uh, the red and brown man. This is what this nation was founded on. So this is a way to right what has been so wrong in this country for so long. And um, to correct the egregious acts of Proposition 209, we've seen the quantitative and qualitative data uh, of, of the last 24 years. African Americans, Latinos, women are in no better position. Matter of fact, they're in worse position today than they were 24 years ago when it comes to contracting opportunities, employment opportunities, educational opportunities. We've also seen in the last seven months since this pandemic, who has been impacted the most. And it's been our frontline workers who again are primarily African American, Latino and women. And when it came to PPE, I mean PPP uh, resources and revenue, we saw again, who was excluded from that and all kind of business loans. Again, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses. It took almost three rounds of monies to be distributed before African Americans and Latinos received any of this money. And the data shows that 60% of all small businesses that have been impacted by um, this pandemic are will never open again and again most of those are owned by people of color we've also seen the health disparities uh, because of uh this pandemic again african-american and latinos are infected at a higher rate and they're dying at a higher rate there are fewer medical resources in their communities we've seen the impact of education 
the lack of uh, internet and the failure of distant learning, again, impacting Under Bradford, I believe we lost you. It appears that your your video uh, has the Pence country and this is in a state yeah. as it related to race. And again, Prop 209 that was passed 24 years ago uh, has only further to exacerbate those problems. You have four fewer, far fewer minorities that are now going to college, let alone graduating uh, from college. And let me counter the argument that some of our Asian brothers and sisters are saying that uh, if we look at race, it's going to impact them. Well, their numbers haven't grown in uh, the UC and CSU system in the last 24 years. Where their numbers have grown are at Harvard, Yale, University of Texas, uh, and other universities, Michigan, who have race as a qualification, as a consideration for admissions. That's where their numbers have grown, not here in California. This should not be a zero sum gain when we talk about inclusion. And that's what we should all be about, fighting to make sure everyone has an opportunity at um, the American dream. And we have spent the majority of the last 24 years cobbling around uh, this thing called equity and, uh, and, and inequality and um, uh, affirmative action. I've lost track of the number of pieces of legislation that I've introduced that uh, encourages contracting with women-owned, minority-owned businesses. We wouldn't have to do that if, it, if this was a fair and balanced system. Just uh, last week, the governor signed my colleague, Assemblyman Chris Holden's bill as it relates to corporate board diversity. Again, why would we need legislation to say you need diversity on your corporate boards if race wasn't a factor? Over, uh, with over 600 corporations uh, in California, the California-based Cal uh, California corporations in California, the majority have no minorities, no minorities at all on those boards. And that's why the governor was eager to sign that legislation to help, again, balance uh, this uh, great injustice. I authored legislation uh, even in the cannabis space. We passed a Proposition 64 uh, three years ago, technically four years ago. It went into effect in 2017. Within a year of a new industry being grown, 80% of the owner operators in the cannabis space were white men. How does that happen? If we're not looking at race as a qualifying factor or discriminating disqualifying factor. That's why I had to introduce SB 1294 that Jerry Brown signed and now Gavin Newsom supports to provide social equity in this space. Because again, we quickly saw the majority of people who are getting licensed in this business were again, white males. Race is a factor in everything that we do. And to sit here and deny that it hasn't been, we're not true to ourselves. This, all it does is create uh, equal playing field. It does not establish quotas in any kind of way. We still want the most qualified person to be hired. We still want the most qualified person to go uh, to get into college. But at the same time, we, st we need to look at, again, the lack of diversity in everything that we do. That's why I'm a strong proponent of Prop 16, that's why I was a co-author of ACA 5, and that's why I'm a strong yes on Proposition 16. Thank you, Senator Bradford, for that um, introduction to Prop 16 and uh, that passionate display of the importance of, um, uh, of Prop 16 from, from your perspective. Now, I, I'd also like to invite Board Member Ochoa to the stage. Rosalie C. Ochoa uh, Bo, I believe is how you pronounce it. Is Bogue. Bogue, thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is a native Californian. Uh, she has 16 years success as a realtor and received the Women of Distinction Award uh, recently. She's devoted to um, devoted herself to helping others achieve the American dream, and is a graduate from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, and from there, went on to teach English learner language. Uh, English language learners. Today, she serves on the Yukaipa Calamesa Joint Unified School Board. 
uh, everyone, please virtually welcome board member Yukai, uh, board member of Yukaipa Cali Mesa School District Rosalisi Ochoa to present the argument against Prop 16. And I will note um, there's uh, six minutes for for yourself to to make the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name, as stated, is Rosalicia Ochoa Bogue. I'm an entrepreneur, school board member, and a state senate candidate. I'm here today to speak on behalf of Californians for Equal Rights, No. 16, the Principal Ballot Measure Committee in opposition to Prop 16. Um, thank you for introducing me, and thank you for inviting me to this energetic forum. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to our audience on such a vital issue to our state and our Latin uh, community. No One Sixteen Committee is led by former UC Regent Mr. Ward Connolly, who also chaired the California Civil Rights Initiative that facilitated the passage of Prop 209, which Prop 16 seeks to repeal. Prop 16 is unjust, unnecessary, and plainly wrong. Let me elaborate on that just a bit. Prop 16 removes these words from our state constitution, and I quote, the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any group, individual, I'm sorry, to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the operation of public employment, public education, or public contracting, end quote. Passed by popular um, vote in 1996, Prop 209, has set a progressive precedent of anti-discrimination laws in nine U.S. states and that mirror the true spirit of landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964. It stops racism, makes it so that the government picks the most qualified contractors, students, and employees based on merit, not race, sex, ethnicity, or national origin. In reality, since 1996, California has made strides in diversity and inclusion in public education, employment, and contracting. Underrepresented minorities have experienced significant gains in enrollment and graduation at both UC and CSUs. Minority admissions at UC exceeded those of 1996, both in absolute numbers and as a percentage of all admits, 90% in 1996 to 37% in 2019. In July of 2020, the UC system announced a historic first for admitting Latino students as the largest freshman group, um, escorted by the UCLA uh, newspaper. Um, Four-year graduation rates in, of underrepresented racial minorities rose from 31.3% during the 1995-97 period to 55%. 0.1% in 2014. The CSU system has a student body that is 40% Hispanic. Latino admissions at UC increased 432% since 1996. Let me repeat that one more time. Latino admissions at UC increased 432% since 1996. Both women and men of color saw largest gains in employment rates proportional to their working age population growth. Minority civil servants increased from 38%, 70,000 in 1990, to 50%, 110,000 in 2007. Women in California today make up the majority of the law profession and the majority of college degrees earners. While our state embraces the nation's strongest equal pay law. In contracting, according to a peer-reviewed study by a UC Santa Cruz economist, the California Department of Transportation saved approximately $64 million between 1998 and 1999 from extra costs associated with preference. That's about a billion dollars in 2020 dollars. We are already there. Let's celebrate our truly diverse and dynamic California and recognize extra government measures on race and sex preference are unnecessary and then will incur great harms in California's tax base, economy, productivity, and competitiveness. 
Prop 16 will stoke racism and tensions among racial minorities because it only offers a band-aid solution to a systemic problem in our K-12 education. The problem of racial achievement gap must be addressed sufficiently at the community and family levels. We must promote excellency in learning and education. For example, 57% of social economic disadvantaged Asian American students are reading at proficient levels, compared with 31% for disadvantaged Hispanic students and 12% for disadvantaged Black students. Prop 16 does nothing to solve root causes behind the persistent achievement gap. Instead, the scapegoat goats, <clears throat> it scapegoats hardworking students with the inflammatory and false label of overrepresentation. Those from impoverished backgrounds stand to lose the most. For those who are supposed to benefit from racial preferences, they will be subjugated to the toxic, toxic stigma and underperformance and mismatch. Do we want that for our students? Most importantly, Prop 16 is morally wrong in principle as its politically correct proponents ruthlessly attack the American creed of equal opportunity and merit. Prop 16 is about reestablishing backwards governmental purposes based on race and sex, thereby legalizing discrimination. It was put on this year's ballot through legislative fast track via political climate of race, tensions, and groupthink. Prop 16 is funded by certain elites with sing such as a single billionaire donor who contributed $5.5 million. These billionaires and special interest groups feel entitled to impose racial preferences on Californians and clamor to curry favor with regulators and politicians in Sacramento. In sharp contrast, the no on Prop 16 has amassed nearly 6,000 donors in less than three months demonstrating a historic groundswell of grassroots support from voters across the state. No on 16 is a broad-based grassroots movement by the people and for the people. The coalition has a bipartisan support from prominent Republicans, long-term Democrats, and a prominent independents. We are bringing people together on this one. So let me summarize with the following five points on no and 16. One, Prop 16 is not affirmative action. Need-based affirmative action has never been banned in California. Prop 16 is a political, what I would call a cover-up or a, a band-aid over policy failures to improve K-12 education in underprivileged communities. Prop 16 is backed by billionaire contributions, special interest groups, in certain types of elites. Prop 16 is the epitome of racism and illiberal attacks on the democratic principles of equality and liberty. It ruthlessly targets Asian Americans uh, of dissent and penalizes hard work, initiative, and excellence. Prop 16 is not about diversity because diversity has never been absent in California. We're a beautiful state. And number five, Prop 16 will hurt as intended benefit, it will hurt its intended beneficiaries. It will drag everyone down by lowering standards and perpetuating academic mismatch and negative stigmas against the underserved. I want to end my presentation today with my personal perspective. Why is this personal? For me, I'm a first generation native Californian with my roots in Mexico. My parents were immigrants. I come from a modest working class family and I too have encountered tremendous social economic challenges in my pursuit of the American dream. But I have prevailed. Board member Ochoa? Yes. Um, I'm gonna give you just one more minute to wrap up. We've already gone over time quite a bit. Certainly, absolutely. Um, but I have prevailed with resolve and an unshakable faith in what's eternally true to the American experiment of tree quality. I'm a successful entrepreneur in the real estate industry a proud mom of three amazing children, including, uh, well, I won't talk about them later. We won't. Okay. With the screen freezing, I'm going to take that moment to transition to, to the panel. Um, thank you for your presentation, Rosalie, or um, board member. 
right now we're going to go to the panel as mentioned and before we actually jump into the panel i do want to share a couple group norms um and for all of them this is a friendly reminder i don't think we we really need to spend too much time here but we are going to ask that everyone all the panelists and your responses please be respectful of different opinions and and positions don't interrupt your um, other panelists and please stay on time so in regards to time we will have three minutes per um, per speaker or per panelist that selects to respond to each question next slide all right um so those are our panelists our three panelists include senator bradford um, representing the yes on Prop Proposition 16 again, as well as um, Rosalie, Rosalisi Ochoa, uh, board member for Yucaipa Cali Mesa School District, representing the no on Prop 16 position. And I do want to point out, apologize, we don't have her photo up. Um, we, there was a last minute change, so, uh, but we are so grateful to have, have you participate. We also have Carlos Morgner of Morgner Construction uh, Management joining us as a um, minority business enterprise. And lastly, Kelly Irving uh, with the Long Beach Transit Authority um, joining us today in her role as Regulatory Compliance and Civil Rights Officer. Next slide. All right, so the first question, uh, currently there are federal requirements, uh, reporting requirements related to affirmative action in employment and contracting. If Proposition 16 is passed, what if any reporting requirements on affirmative action activities can public entities expect for subcontracting, hiring, as well as college acceptance? And this question is for Senator Bradford and uh, Rosalisi, um, board member Ochoa, who would like to well, go first? Proposition 16 has no reporting requirement. It has checks and balances, but it has no reporting requirements. And I just want to counter some of the things that Ms. Ochoa stated as it related to the area of transportation. We passed uh, uh, historic transportation bill SB1 in 2017. There is specific language in SB1 that speaks to women and minority owned businesses because Governor Brown truly agreed again that minorities were not getting any of this Caltrans work. We now have an inspector general whose sole role is to make sure that women and minority contractors uh, businesses have an opportunity at this work. We wouldn't need all these checks and balances already on the state level if this was a colorblind fair system. So uh, Prop 16 does not require um, it's the so-called uh, reporting requirements, but it will have oversight, again, to make sure that diversity is reflected, which clearly doesn't exist in anything that we're doing here in California and across this country. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, Board Member Choa Bogue, would you like to respond to the question as well? You're muted. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yes. Perfect. Um, right now we have three kinds of affirmative action programs that are currently legal in California, for which no new reporting requirements should be expected. Um, we have social, economic-based affirmative action programs, bona fide sex-conscious measures, and race-conscious uh, measures and state programs that take federal money. Um, do you want me to go into some examples or should I get at that? You have three minutes to respond and two, two remaining. Okay. Um, give you some, um, some programs right now that we have. Um, the University of California guidelines for addressing race and gender equity in academic programs in compliance with Prop 209. It's July 2015. Federal affirmative action regulations and university policy requires that all campus develop and maintain a written affirmative action programs covering staff, faculty, and all other academic employees. 
Um, we have the general university policy regarding academic appointment affirmative actions and non-discrimination in employment, July 2012. It is the policy of the university, I quote, um, University of California to undertake affirmative action consistent with its obligation as a federal contractor for minorities and women, for persons with disabilities, and for covered veterans. Um, the UCLA campus human resources procedure 14 affirmative uh, uh, action, affirmative action plan AAP, a written document by which the university is committed to eliminate and remedy past discriminations against protected classes and underutilization of women and minorities. As a federal contractor with contracts in excess of $50,000 and 50 or more employees, the University of California is required by executive order 11,246 to develop and maintain a written AAP and programs to correct the underutilization of women and minorities in its workforce. And lastly, the City of Los Angeles Department of Public Works Bureau of Contract Administration Affirmative Action. While Proposition 209 imposes considerable limits on affirmative action in public contracting, it leaves considerable leeway for outreach efforts and almost certainly permits state and local agencies to engage in more aggressive data collection efforts in order to better ensure public contracts um, that are allocated in fair, efficient, and non-discriminatory manner. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the federal affirmative action programs. We'll come back to that question uh, a little bit later and how that balances between state and federal <laughs> programs. Uh, the next question is, Prop 16 drafters contend that its passage will impact public education, hiring, and contracting. Since they say that education is, uh, since you know we say as a society, uh, education is the great equalizer, uh, we will begin with our first question targeted to education. <clears throat> while the Prop 16, well, excuse me, Prop 209 was passed in 1996 in large part institutions of higher education began applying the new constitutional amendment while reviewing college applications received in fall of 1997, which would in turn impact the incoming class of 1998. What, if any, has been the demographic shift in public higher education, um, excuse me, attendance rates and retention rates from 1998 to today? And again, this question is, is posed for Senator Bradford, if you'd like to respond or our board member or Choa both. Ms. Choa can go first. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, so as I mentioned in my opening statement, diversity has improved in California's public universities over the last two decades. UC, nine campuses, six Hispanic serving institutions, or awarded higher education excellence and diversity, strategic partnerships with historically black um, extensive outreach to underserved students through the early academic outreach program, the MESA program and Puente project. CSU, 23 campuses, 40% Hispanic, 21 meet the HSI criteria. Minority graduations at UC, Four-year graduation rates of underrepresented racial minorities rose from 31.3% during the 1995 to 97 period to 36.6 during 1998 to 2000, then to 43.3% during the 2001 to 2003 period. In 2014, URM's four-year graduation rates rose to a record high of 55.1%. The six-year graduation rate has fared even better with a 65.5% in 1998 and 75.1% in 2013. Um, in July of 2020, the UC system announced a historic first for admitting Latino students as the largest freshman group, while UC Berkeley this year admitted record high numbers of Blacks. 737 and Latinos, 3,379 freshmen. So minority admissions at UC exceeded those of 1996, both in absolute numbers and as a percentage of all admits, 18.69% in 1996 to 36.53% in 2019. Thank you. Um, 
I'm would be interested in seeing uh, that data that Ms. Ochoa has because I've spent the last 10 years as a member of the California legislature. And one thing we know for sure, uh, Dr. Shirley Weber, who was my college professor at San Diego State and who was the primary author of ACA 5, uh, one thing she knows and have shared with all the ethnic cauc caucuses is that enrollment amongst minority students has, has an all-time low. So if you see this great spike in the last year, it's because if you go from zero to one, that's a 100% increase in enrollment. And so it's not hard to spike your numbers when your enrollment was so low to start with. So, um, and I was the author last year of SB 206. Uh, I don't know if you guys know that. That's called the Fair Play Pay to Play Act for college students, where we saw the greatest enrollment, and we heard it from women and minority students. The only people of color that are on any of these major universities are athletes. They're student athletes. They're not everyday students. I mean, we've even had Michelle Obama who stated that when she got to Yale, which is, uh, I mean, Princeton, and that she felt on an island because it was so few minorities uh, and people that look like her uh, on co college campuses. Uh, I have visited college campuses. Enrollment has not increased. Graduation has not increased. It has gone down and for our Asian brothers and sisters, as I stated in my opening, their numbers have not, uh, have surely haven't increased. They're, they've decreased and where they show growth again is at the University of Texas, University of Michigan, Yale, Harvard, those institutions that use race as a qualifying consideration for admissions. That's where their numbers have grown, not here in California. John Perez, former speaker, good colleague of mine, who's a UC regent, he will always also argue that numbers for uh, African-American and Latinos are at all time low in most of these UC campuses. Yeah, this is, this is Carlos Morgner. I'd like to interject a little bit here. I'm also, I'm also a CPA and I deal with numbers and statistics all the time. I think what we're looking at here is not the quantity, but the quality of the education. If they go into African studies, Latino studies, sociology, I think we have to look encouraging the, uh, the licensed trades, not just the uh, master's degrees and stuff like that. The licensed trades will allow our people to, to actually charge for their services and not just have to sell their, their backgrounds and history. So I think we have to look at not statistics per se, and I respect what you're saying, Mrs. Shaw, but I think we have to look at the quality of the type of education they're getting so that we have more CPAs, more lawyers, uh, more doctors and, and those kind of trades. So I think numbers are okay, but they don't tell the complete story. Thank you, Mr. Morgner. Our next question is, California is the most populous state in the country at just under 40 million people. The most racially diverse and possibly by, uh, by religion and other metrics of diversity as well, and the fifth largest economy in the world. With this standing, the decisions made here in California has the potential to have ripple effects, not just within the state, but across the country, as well as globally. How would the repeal of Prop 209 impact our system uh, of public education that ultimately feeds into our workforce and our economy? And this question is open to all panelists. Don't be shy. All right, well, I'll start. Um, I, I think it's often said, so goes California, so goes the nation. I think uh, it was that a great president uh, where we need to go as a nation, we've seen what happened in the last four years. We have a racist and a bigot in the house that has spurred racial division that has been festered under a rock for the last 200 years. And it has all come out in full display over the last four years. And I think uh, Proposition uh, 16 is timely. Uh, Ms. Ochoa stated it was based on the climate of the day. No. Uh, ACA 5 was introduced last year, well before the pandemic, well before the George Floyd, the Breonna Taylors, the, you know, Andres, uh, 
uh, Godano's, all the full the senseless killings with uh, law enforcement, the Ahmad operation. No, this was introduced last year again based on the data and information that we uh, we had in the legislature. Again, I think it moves the needle not only for California but for this nation to be far more inclusive. Because again, if we don't want to look at this the history of this country and accept the fact that the history of this country was founded on racism. And to say that those barriers have been removed in the last 200 years, you're lying to yourselves. So um, I, I think it, it's, it's a good uh, framework for the rest of the nation to follow if we're able to pass Proposition 16. Thank you, Senator Bradford. Yes, uh, Carlos Morgner. I think we have to look at spreading the wealth. That's the concept I'm proposing here. All ships will rise when the money is spread out to all people, the jobs, the education, and uh, the, econom the economy should gain by allowing more free flow of monies, by having more jobs and having more talent through the minority communities. They'll be able to buy more goods, buy the cars, uh, be able to pass some of that down to their children and generations. So all ships will rise by spreading the wealth. And I always believe that's one of the opportunities of these type of programs to allow the economic benefits to be sustained by all people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morgner. Any other panelists uh, would like to respond to this question? Um, I'd just like to make a couple of remarks. Um, just on, on Senator's um, question in regards to the data, um, those were those come from the UC and the CSU's official admissions database, just uh, for your reference on that. You had asked earlier about that, um, but we'd be more than happy to send you the links for that. Um, number two, um, if Prop 16 passes, um, the already mammoth California budget deficit will increase exponentially to overpay for public contracts, fund disparity studies, provide diversity and equity officers, and revamp new admissions programs. But, you know, let me just quickly say that as a, as a daughter of immigrant parents, I completely agree with Mr. Is it Munger? Monts? Morgner. 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 Um, I completely you agree. Call me Carlos. <laughs> Carlos. Okay. Un placer, señor Carlos. Um, but I do, I do want to state that as a daughter of immigrant parents who has, who truly believes in education opportunities, um, I, I really, I completely agree with you that we do need to have opportunity and wealth spread out to it. But we have to look at why we are not having those, those, those opportunities. And I, you know, from a teacher's perspective, from a mother's perspective, from um, someone who traveled quite a bit in, in California, attending different, different schools, I can tell you right now that we truly have to focus at the root of the problems. And I think a lot of it has to do with our education, the quality of education that we're providing and encouraging our, our to making sure that people and parents have choice in, in their educational opportunities to make sure that they, those needs are met. Because as immigrants and as, especially as, as a Latino uh, community, people want to be successful. They want their children to be successful. They want to have great education. They want to be entrepreneurs. That innately is the immigrant um, spirit. And so why is that not happening? I honestly, I, I, I want to look into our educational system and making sure that K-12 education is providing preparation for, our, these, for these students to be successful and to have more opportunities. And you're right. I love the fact that you said not just certain types of uh, careers that um, you have to sell your services, but one that you can actually charge for. So um, just a little thought on that one, just a personal thought. Well, very good. I appreciate that. Well, times are changing. You know, I, I kind of believe in the Darwin philosophy or concept that it's not, it's not the strongest nor the fastest, but those that adapt to their circumstances. That's the evolution of process. And I think uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg exemplified that by by going to with the women's rights and the things that she proposed as when she said uh, the constitution it doesn't mention women and also doesn't mention the word freedom but it does mention that times are changing 
And that's why these type of laws are, are being proposed by, by our people and by people in responsible positions because they see the system can be improved. And that's what I see Proposition 16 representing. We're trying to improve a system to make it fair and equal for everybody. If not, why do we have these riots? Why do we have sicknesses? Why do we have all these issues, this division in, in, in our system right now? People aren't comfortable with what the laws are. So let's use the evolutionary process of Charles Darwin and let's adapt to the change. We as Hispanics, I'm an immigrant, I'm originally from Ecuador, and, uh, and I, I'm a beneficiary of these programs and I appreciate them, but they don't, it's necessarily not an award, it's a responsibility. And that responsibility means that we have to do better. Thank you. Um, can I just respond to that really quick? Um, sure, well, this will be the last response for this question, but go okay. ahead. Okay, no, no, go ahead. Well, I'll let someone else speak, that's fine. I, I can, I'm sure I can bring in my other thoughts through another question. All right, we have a couple more questions. Thank you. Board member Joa Bog for um, holding back a bit. <laughs> <laughs> the California Official Voter Information Guide states that the potential fiscal effects of implementing programs uh, is highly uncertain. Understanding that if Prop 16 is repealed, excuse me, if Prop 209 is repealed, each state and local entity could make a number of decisions about policies and programs that could incur costs. What are the anticipated short and long-term statewide or local impact gains or losses for the economy by repealing Prop 209? Um, I don't think there will be any long-term gains. Again, uh, over the last 24 years, minority contractors, women-owned contractors have lost on average of a billion dollars annually in contract opportunities because of the passage of 209. Uh, will it require cities to have a more uh, critical eye when uh, vetting and, and letting out contracts? Yes, but I don't see any additional cost to government. And I just think that's a scare tactic to say, oh, it's going to overburden us. Let me tell you what's overburdened us, this pandemic. Prior to this pandemic, we had $54 billion in California reserves. We've been through half of that already in just six months. So this continued pandemic, again, that is impacting minorities harder than any other group in this nation, be it through healthcare, through education, that's the impact that we should be worrying about. And those are what we should be willing to address. I think cities and the state government can easily address uh, uh, what's going to be involved in looking at an applicant, be it for a job, uh, a uh, contracting opportunity, without any additional uh, burden or cost to any of those governmental entities. Thank you, Senator Bradford. I would like, to, this is Kelly Irving, I'd like to add, um, from an agency's perspective, anticipated long-term gains will be made with repealing Prop 209 from an employment, a contracting um, perspective. I also will add that potentially be due to the education, the access of quality education in non-traditional um, industries, we will see gains and be able to have a strong workforce to be able to come into public agencies. So repealing a Prop 209, I see it as a economic gain. You're employing people, you're allowing uh, individuals access to education, educational opportunities that were not traditionally um, available or recruited in the, in, during the phase of Prop 209. Prop 16, I do believe, will have a very positive economic um, impact, short and long term. Thank you, Kelly. Would any of the other panelists like to respond? Um, Sounds like a maybe. I'm trying to see, like, do we keep going? Um, so let me just um, state this. Um, in contracting, according to a peer-reviewed study by UC Santa Cruz Economist, 
The California Department of Transportation saved approximately $64 million between 1998 and 1999 in extra costs associated with preferential contracting. That's about a billion dollar, or did I read this one? I'm sorry if I talked about this one yet. Um, after Prop 209, the prices uh, on state funded contracts fell by 5.6 relative to federal funded projects, which for which preferences still applied. So anyway, um, that's a lot of money that uh, we can say. I'm not sure. Anyway, that's just uh, well, some, some thoughts. Well, um, thank you, board member um, Ochoa Bull. I would like to add this from an agency's perspective, the numbers that you're speaking of are really tied to federal funding where there are uh, racial, uh, race, race and gender conscious or neutral measures based on the dollars we receive from a federal agency. What we're talking about today is really state funded projects, state and local funded projects where we as agencies cannot collect that data. We have to then go into a race neutral environment where we look at small business. And we know that small business could very well be owned and operated by uh, minorities or, or women-owned firms, but we're not calculating those dollars from their perspective, meaning their characteristic perspective. So when you talk about these numbers, you're actually bringing the um, stats related to federally funded projects. And that there is not this conversation. I mean, because we're going to actually have greater impact when it comes to state and local dollar funded projects where we're able to fill our workforce with the uh, whatever is missing, meaning the groups that are missing, whether it's women, you talked about the affirmative action plan, the state of California does not ask for an AAP, but the federal government does. It asks for all agencies receiving federal funding to report out every odd year your EEO4. And then what, based on that, we're having to talk to or address the issues where we have deficiencies. And so therefore, individuals such as myself, um, I'm that inclusionista, we have to actually come up with real creative measures to try to recruit and retain individuals that are underrepresented on a federal level. What we're talking about today is really the state funded projects. So as I look at my federal funded projects, that's my, those are my initiatives for federal funded projects. When I look at our state and local funded projects, I cannot look at, I may know the numbers, but I cannot make a, a, a concerted effort to actually engage those deficiencies without being in violation of the law. And so we're talking about um, <laughs> systemic discrimination that's intrinsic in what we are doing as an agency or public agency. We are, and I speak from a public agency's perspective, but as we contract with our prime contractors, we, if it's federally funded, we push that requirement down into the requirements of our contract to our prime contractors. If it's state or local, we cannot request for any monitoring or, or um, conscious measures to actually engage women or people, or people of color in those particular numbers, whether or not it's our labor force and or our contracting. So I do believe if in fact Prop 209 is repealed, it will allow practitioners such as myself to be able to come up and, and flow creative measures to be race and um, gender conscious relative to our state and local funded projects. Uh, yes. Thank you, Kelly. That, that... Carlos Morgan, can I add a little bit? Sure. We're talking about America, the United States of America, the largest economy in the world. If we're looking at a percentage like that, a minuscule percentage to the net worth of what the United States is, yes. it's really in, inconsequential. We have to look at the future. This is improving the future to give these agencies flexibility for the jobs of the future, the electrification of America, the infrastructures of America that's going on. We need to prepare this workforce and this is gonna give them the tools in order to build the next economy of, of workers. And we need, need to participate in a meaningful way. I'm doing major work on in car charging in the areas where we're gonna be training a lot of the mechanics, a lot of the people that are gonna know electrification and the infrastructure. So these are, basic jobs for the minorities 
whether they be working with their hands, their heads, and with their hearts. Thank you, Mr. Morgner and, um, and Kelly as well. And I think this is a really good transition to our last and final question. And it's really around that balance between federally and state funded projects. Uh, as we know, Prop 209 repealed affirmative action from California or removed it from California, made it constitutionally um, Ill illegal, as Kelly mentioned. However, federally, um, there still is affirmative action, both in other states as well as in the federal government. So how will Prop 16 impact public entities uh, receiving both federal funds that have race and gender conscious uh, measures uh, if Prop 16 is not passed? which will require state and locals to, um, to maintain a neutral stance. How, how do the two balance? I like to start off if I may. Okay, so as a federal, as an agency that receives federal funding for um, a DBE perspective, a disadvantaged business enterprise program perspective, any um, agency that receives a grant in excess of $250,000 is required to have a DBE program. That DBE program, much like Long Beach Transit or the City of LA or Caltrans, would require to, if, if you're an agency, small, you're small, you will follow suit of what the nearest, um, the nearest agency, large agency, such as a Metro. For Long Beach Transit, it would be Metro. It, every three to five years, those agencies have to conduct what is called a disparity study. And I think board member uh, Ochoa Bo was, um, spoke to a disparity study. That disparity study is actually looking at the utilization of minorities and women on the contractors and evaluating the barriers that are presented by the contracting agency, meaning the owner, uh, Long Beach Transit or Metro or Caltrans and or their prime contractors. So what we're seeing, we're, we're not seeing that firms that are owned by women and or minorities are ranking in the same dollar, the dollar, dollar categories as the prime contractors. That in itself, when we look at those prime contract, uh, contracts and then we look at the utilization of women in minority owned firms, we that's when you'll see a race conscious measure that results from this disparity study that's conducted every three to five years. Many of these agencies are having to put in place a race conscious uh, a goal in order to try to level the playing field for these small firms to participate. If we did not have that, those firms more than likely put, would not be able to grow large enough to become a competitive, a competitive competi competing prime. So let's now break it down to the state level. On the state level, we are not allowed to set goals based on a disadvantaged business enterprise um, uh, category. So you're left to only engage that firm from a small business perspective. And in that, you may know that the firm is minority or woman owned, but you're only looking at the overall consensus of whether or not they're just small. And when you're looking at that, that means there are other people in entering into that, um, that uh, market that may not be minority or woman owned. So when you look at the overall um, accessibility to contracts, the availability pool of workforce, and also um, the education of these particular individuals, whether or not it's trade and or for two or four year universities, we are concerned from a public agencies because we want the very best product for the very best price because we are um, the overseers or the uh, we have the responsibility of watching over the citizens money so our goal is to to be fair and our goal is also to level the playing field so that these firms can participate so prop in right now we're in prop 209 we're not allowed to monitor the minority and women participation on local, on state and local funded projects. And so if we are funded by Caltrans, we have to keep in, in, in mind that we are, we're prohibited from putting a concerted effort out to minority or women owned firms. So on our federal uh, uh, funded projects, we are allowed to actually put in conscious measures to engage and outreach and bring those firms in. Many times you'll see as a result of Prop 209, you saw 
in the recent past, you see a lot of um, public agencies putting in a um, small business set aside because they're actually trying to be creative to allow for small firms that more than likely are minority or women owned because there are thresholds that they cannot exceed uh, in order to participate on those contracts. But when you look at that population, the number of minorities and women in the SBE program winning contracts is not great. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that perspective, Kelly. We have about three minutes left in, um, in the hour. So I wanna give um, a chance for a one minute wrap up for each panelist. And I'm just gonna start from where I see the pictures going from left to right. Um, so I'll start with Mr. Morgner. Uh, you have one minute to close out. Well, listening to Kelly, I, I interpreted that it's gonna give her and the agencies flexibility to improve the system. So I see Proposition 16 enhancing that opportunity to give flexibility to the agencies, to the contractors, in order to expand the pool of services and the people that would have those opportunities. I can only speak from my personal experiences and, and, and the benefits that we receive now that my daughter's uh, minorities, women-owned business taken over a lot of the issues. So to have that flexibility in, in hands of respectable people like Kelly would enhance the whole system of opportunities for all of us. So what Proposition 16 does, it improves the 209 by making uh, um, flexibility uh, in these areas of opportunities for these type of agencies and also with the contractors. And as we all know, the we need to spread the money and the financial capabilities for these small businesses and, and capital. And a lot of them can't get bonded. A lot of them can't buy the equipment. A lot of them won't be able to compete at this stage. So by all, giving these agencies a little bit of flexibility in the bonding, in the financial, and even with the banks, I think we can all benefit in the statistics as Mrs. Ochoa said, will come become meaningful and not just numbers. They'll become real people doing real work. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Um, board member Ochoa Bogue, you have one minute closeout. You're currently muted. I recognize and relate to the historical and contemporary struggles of Latino Americans. Um, but I also recognize that our personal struggles are not confined to a racial or ethnic box. The human experience is multifaceted and unique and an individual and individual basis. Um, Prop 16 reduces our human struggles to a one dimensional veneer of perceived systemic racism. Um, when its proponents are in fact advocating for racism that is treating individuals and groups differently based on race. Two wrongs won't make it right. The majority of Californian voters are also on our side as that indicated by a recent poll from the Public Policy Institute of California. Defeating Prop 16 would not only represent a repudiation of a special interest in the most populous state, itself a national story, but signal national that days are numbered for groupthink, identity politics, and, state and racial spoils. And then I'd also like to state that from a mother's perspective, you know, I worry about showing preferential treatment, um, you know, in our homes with our children and what type of environment that creates in our home. And I would hate to have that come back to California as a state uh, with Prop 16 um, in, in the environment that that will create with people. So. Um, just as I would not create a system in my home to prefer one child over another because of X, Y, and Z or one, two, and three, I, I worry that California would be doing that with Prop 60. Thank you, Board Member Chobo. Ms. Irving, you have one minute to um, close out. Okay, you know I can't say anything. I was going to say, I'm going to be <laughs> tough on you. <laughs> okay, I will say this. From the perspective of being, uh, being inclusive, um, from an agency perspective, it's very important that we look at the, the both sides 
and really look at what the true numbers are reflective across all groups, meaning women and each category of minorities. With that being said, as an agency that values the contributions of a very diverse workforce, we want to make sure that we are working hard to support law that encourages um, a heterogeneous a genius organization. Homogeneous organizations are very limited to just one perspective, one, one line of business. What we want to do is cre create an opportunity for people that have diverse walks of life, diverse backgrounds and experiences and characteristics to be able to convene here in our agency to bring the ve very best service that we can provide. With that being said, uh, Prop 16, will, I believe, will allow for practitioners such as myself to have a greater ability to actually recruit the very best. We're not looking for preferential. We're not supporting preferential. We're actually giving everybody an equal, not equality, but an equity opportunity to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, and you made it in the one minute. <laughs> Senator Bradford, could you close us out today with your, your closing remarks? I should just say ditto to what Ms. Uh, Irving and uh, Mr. <laughs> Morgner stated. I think they hit the nail on the head, and you see why I worked for Kelly Irving over those years. But uh, I, I want to thank all the participants here today. But uh, Proposition 16 is a common sense measure. For any of us to believe that California, let alone the United States, is not a race-based country and everything that is done of any significance of race and gender is not being considered and you're living under a rock. This does not create quotas. It doesn't uh, create prefer preferential treatment. It just creates as Irving says, uh, equity lands to make sure everyone has a seat at the table. I can, again, list hundreds of pieces of legislation that we've passed in the California legislature over the last 24 years that has nibbled around the edges of trying to get to this equity uh, issue of, of fairness. And they constantly have to qualify businesses as disadvantaged. That in of itself is a stigma because a lot of major uh, corporations and prime contractors say, oh, disadvantage, that means you're lacking in some way. No, that's how we have to frame some of these businesses. They're not disadvantaged in skill set, where their disadvantages is an opportunity. So Prop 16 will give us opportunity at contracting uh, opportunities, at employment opportunities, at educational opportunities, healthcare opportunities. All this does is level the playing field. And again, I, I don't want to make this too political, but I think we've seen in the last four years where this country is going, and it's not in a unifying uh, direction. It's more of a divisive racial hatred direction. And Proposition 16 helped address some of those disparities by making sure everybody has a seat at the table. California and the United States is truly the love opportunity, but there are many barriers in front of people of color to get to those opportunities. This helps remove some of those barriers. Thank you, Senator. And thank you to all of our panelists for joining today. I would like to share to those that are listening that you can re-listen if you um, miss something because it will be posted on, um, I believe on Facebook as well as LinkedIn. Uh, this was a recorded session and you can also share it so that you can provide this education to other folks in your network. It's, it's important that we're all educated when we get to the ballot box or maybe this year the mailbox uh, to, to drop in our, our ballots. So thank you all and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you all for caring thank and you. voting. Thank you for allowing us to come and share our thoughts. Yes. Thank you so much. You were excellent. Love you. Thank you. Let's be the minute. Has the recording stopped, Sandy? Yes. <laughs>